Praise the Lord. Church, I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome you to this special service in Jesus' name. And I pray that God will do something in your life. Something special. Tailor made from heaven. Just for you. I said, just for you. The blessing of the Lord will enrich your life. Enrich your family. And reach our church. And everywhere the world is getting to today, it will do something definite, something special, something specific in every life in Jesus' name. And I pray that God will give you an attentive heart, hearing in mind that will dwell on the word of God, and your mind will be saturated. With this profitable, penetrating, and pungent word of God in Jesus' name. You will not go back the same way you came in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. A day of worship and a day to submit our heart, our life, our mind, our past, our present, our future into your hands. We're asking, Lord, today, everything will be at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll receive everything we brought to you today in Jesus' name. Cleanse every heart. Put your image in every heart. And help us, Lord, to have the focus on what pleases you, on what you demand, and the way you ought to live. Glorify yourself, Lord, in the whole church as well as in every life and family. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. That's good, but give me another amen before you sit down. Now give my great amen to the Almighty God. God bless you. you. can see I'm coming to Psalm 29 and I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 29, I'm reading from verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. As we come to present ourselves before the Lord, and we present ourselves before the Lord every day, every time, wherever we are, it says we give to the Lord, if we're mighty, like the angels, mighty among men, and mighty in our sight. You give unto the Lord the glory and the strength that belongs to him. And then it says, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. When you talk about the Lord, when you think about the Lord, and when you meditate upon his word, and when you present yourself before the Lord, it says you give him the glory that is due to him. And now you worship him in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 96, I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 96, here we're reading from verse 9. It tells us in verse 9 of Psalm 96. It says, Who oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. Again, talking to the people that come to God, and the people that know who God is, and the people who have benefited from the sacrifice of his only begotten son. He says, as you come to him, and you worship him, how you to worship him? You worship him in the beauty of holiness. The way he understands beauty, and the way he describes beauty, and the way he projects beauty 
in his word that beauty according to his own definition according to his own description according to his own demand you worship the lord in the beauty he appreciates i'm coming to some one hundred and ten and i read from verse three it says thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power may this be the day of god's power for us god is omnipotent god is all powerful and god is all present omnipresent and god who is omniscient who knows all things we come before him in the day of his power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of youth isaiah chapter 52 in isaiah chapter 52 i'm reading from verse 1 isaiah chapter 52 verse 1 awake awake put on thy strength o zion Put on thy beautiful garment, so Jerusalem, the holy city. Now, it's not just talking to an individual. It's talking to the city of Jerusalem. And by extension, it's talking to the whole nation of Israel. By still further in extension, it's talking to the church, the people of God. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. And it says, we we'll put on the beautiful garment. O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean, but still shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. Every band, every yoke will be loose from your neck in Jesus' name. O captive daughter of Zion. Today we're looking at a special subject of scripture. Very important. Everybody talks about it, but they don't understand God's own perspective. And it's about beauty. Beauty. And I've read to you, all the verses I've read to you contains that word beauty in the singular or beauty in the plural. I'm talking on the inner and outward beauty of kingdom citizens. We're well, citizens of the kingdom. When we give our lives to Christ, when we repent of our sins, when we turn away from darkness and turn to the light, and when we come to the kingdom and we're ready to live as people saved by the Lord, brought into the kingdom by the Lord, and we become kingdom citizens, there's a kind of beauty you find in a child of God that has read the scriptures and he understands the precepts of God, he understands the promise of God, and he understands the declaration of the word of God, what he calls beauty and you want to understand it from the perspective of the lord himself beauty implies loveliness beauty brings in comeliness beauty means attractiveness and beauty means handsomeness it means gracefulness when we talk of beauty in God's perspective, it is pleasantness. It is a welcome personality. And there is spiritual as well as natural beauty. God sees beauty, well rounded beauty. God knows beauty, heavenly designed beauty. And the world, of course, also sees beauty. But they see passing beauty and they see transient beauty. The world may see beauty in that which God does not see any beauty at all. The world says this is beautiful, and God says, No, that's ugly. That's something terrible. 
It's abomination before the Lord. And yet the world will call that beauty. On the other hand, God sees beauty. While the world is saying, what is this? While the world is saying, this is unacceptable. And yet God says, that is beauty. Come to Isaiah chapter 53. And I'm reading here from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. It's talking about the very beauty of heaven and the most beautiful, magnificent in the whole universe. As he wrote out of a dry ground, he has no form or comeliness in the sight of men. He has no form or comeliness in the sight of the world. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. Here is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Here is the most beautiful in the sight of the Almighty God, in the sight of all the angels of heaven, and the world sees no beauty in him. Look at something. I said chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. I want you to notice something there. The world is looking for beauty and the facial appearance. And they would say, how beautiful upon the mountains are the faces of them that bring good news to us. They're looking at the face. But look at it, what the scripture says, how beautiful upon the mountains at the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that says unto Zion, thy God reigneth. It's clear. There are things in the world, and there are people of the world. To the people of the world, here is a specimen of beauty. But in the sight of the Lord, all that is abomination. Because God looks differently from the way men or women in the whole world, the way they look. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 7. For Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. There we are. The way you look at beauty as a man, as a woman, as a human being, uh, is different from the way God looks at beauty. And the way the world looks at beauty is very different from the way God looks at beauty. And when you come to the sight of the Lord and you say so worship God in the beauty of holiness, you want to define and describe that beauty in the terms in which God defines the term. Already he says, the Lord seeth not, as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord looketh on the heart. We come to Luke. Look at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 16, reading from verse 15. The words of Jesus, and he said unto them, Ye yeah, are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. That's what God is looking at. He's looking at the heart. 
whatever, whatever appears on the outward, he looks at the origin. He looks at the basis. And he looks at the intention. What motivated that outward thing? It says, God knows your hearts. But that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. What people uphold, what they lift up, what they appreciate, and what they praise in the sight of man, that is great, that is good, that is beautiful. In the sight of God, the Lord said, it's abomination. That's what we're looking at this topic critically with understanding the inner and outward beauty of kingdom citizens inner beauty outward beauty in the sight of god of kingdom citizens three things we're looking at number one the corruption of transient beauty through pride transient beauty passing beauty fading beauty worldly beauty the corruption of that by pride point number two the correlation between true beauty and purity the correlation the connection between true beauty and purity when the heart is pure when the heart is committed to god when the heart is focused on god the kind of thing that comes on the outward, the out outward expression of that purity of heart will be true beauty. The correlation, that means the connection between true beauty and purity. Point number three, the commendation of transferable beauty by the prince. Our prince is the Lord, is the prince of peace. The king of kings and the lord of lords. There's a kind of beauty that is transferable. Inner beauty. It is transferable. First of all, it's transferable from Christ to the Christian. And then it's transferable from us to the people we interact with. And it's a commendation of that kind of beauty that is transferable. The commendation of transferable beauty by the priest. We'll come to point number one. The corruption of transient beauty through pride. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. I read from verse 17. Ezekiel 28. And we're reading from verse 17. It says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. That will not be the beauty of Christ. That will not be the beauty of the spirit. That will not be the beauty of kingdom citizens. The beauty that lifts up. The beauty that brings pride. The beauty that symbolizes, here I am. Look at me and look at my appearance. And it says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Beauty corrupted by pride. Second Samuel. I'm reading here from verse chapter 14. Second Samuel chapter 14. We're reading from verse 25. Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 25. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised 
appreciated, looked upon as Absalom for his beauty. Think about that. A man in Israel, so handsome. A man in Israel, so appealing in appearance. And it says there was nobody in comparison in the whole of Israel to be much appreciated for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And what was his pride? Verse 26, and when he pulled his head, for it was every year, at every year's end, that he pulled it, because the air was heavy on him. Therefore, he pulled it. He weighed the air. Have you thought about that? Anybody cutting the air and then gathering the air that was cut together and going to weigh that? That was the vanity of Absalom. And it says it was weighed at 200 shekels after the, after the king's weight. And unto Absalom... There were born three sons, and then it goes on there. But you know the story of Absalom, and you know how his pride corrupted, his pride corrupted him, the pride of beauty. We're looking at Psalm 39, and I read from verse 11, Psalm 39, we're reading from verse 11. When thou with rebukes thus correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. When you rebuke a man for the beauty he takes pride in, for the beauty that corrupts his life, it says, you make that beauty to consume away. Surely, every man is vanity. We're coming to Psalm 73. And I'm reading to you from verse 6. Psalm 73. And we're reading from verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us, Therefore pride compasses them about like a chain. The pride is not the chain. The chain is not the pride. But the chain gives them the pride. They're thinking of self-esteem. They're thinking of being up. They're thinking of higher, being higher than everybody else. And the chains they put on. And the jewelry they put on. And the cosmetics they put on, all those things lift them up. And eventually it even says their pride is like the chain. They wear their pride. They show their pride. They manifest their pride. Therefore pride compasses them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. We're told in Proverbs chapter 31 proverbs chapter 31 reading from verse 30 favor is deceitful and beauty is vain the beauty that pops us up vain the beauty that lifts us up vain the beauty that breaks pride i am and nobody else, it says, that beauty is vain. But a man, that a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Look at what the prophet of Israel, what he said unto them, Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. Reading from verse 16, there is a prophet among the children of Israel. And the most honored prophet at that is a prophet that spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ, 
more than any other prophet of the New Testament. And look at what it says to the daughters of Zion, to the people of Israel, the people that ought to know better and ought to know how to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. But then they corrupted all that. And see what happened. In Isaiah chapter 3 verse 16, Moreover the Lord says, Moreover the Lord says, Moreover the God, the Lord of heaven, the God of heaven, the Almighty says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, they are proud, they are lifted up, and their appearance shows their pride. Even their movement shows their pride. Their apparel shows their pride. Moreover, the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with straight forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and missing as they go, making a tinkling in their feet. That is, they put things on their feet that when the sun shines, it shines as they're lifting up their, their feet and they're moving on. Therefore, the Lord will smite with a scarf the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion. And the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments. The Lord looks at that. And if it's generated by pride, the Lord frowns at that. And he says he'll bring judgment because of that. He says about the ornament of their feet, and their curls, and their round tires like the moon. The chains, and the bracelets, and the mufflers, the bonnets, and the ornaments of the legs. Look at that. That's what the Lord is looking at. Some people say, if they say God does not look at all these things, let's carry on religion. Without talking about this on essential, on important things, it says the Lord says that he looks at all those ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings as well. Verse 21, and the rings and the nose jewels, they even put it on the nose. It's not something new. It had been from of old and God always frowned at it. Verse 22, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins and the glasses for fashion and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be sting. That's the judgment of God that shall come. And instead of a girdle, a range. And instead of well set air boldness. And instead of a stomacher, a garden of sackcloth and burning, instead of beauty. Lamentation chapter 1. You see, from the perspective of the Lord, the kind of pride that corrupts. A kind of pride that makes us unacceptable in the sight of the Lord. Lamentation chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 6. And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. What does that mean? As you kind of smear yourself, treat yourself with chemicals so that you can look more acceptable more beautiful, the chemicals eventually destroy the skin. And then the beauty is departed. Our princes have become like hearts that find no pasture. And they are gone without strength before the pursuer. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end. That is, she goes on beautifying herself, 
decorating herself, putting this ornament and that ornament without the thought of the judgment day. Is not thinking of her end. For those of us who are children of God, and for those of us who know that we are kingdom citizens, you know what? We're thinking of the end. Will God appreciate this at the end? Will he praise this at the end? Will he commend this at the end? Will he reward this at the end? But you see, those daughters of Zion, how many people today that are churchgoers, so-called Christians, they don't think of the end. All they think about is the pleasure the present appearance will give unto them. It says, therefore, she came down woefully, wonderfully. She had no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 8. Zephaniah chapter 1. Reading from verse 8. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princess and the king's children and all such as are closed with strange apparel. God says the day is coming. People might do whatever they want to do today. People might appear the way they want to appear today. And you say, I care for no verse of the Bible. I care for no preaching of the Bible. I will dress the way I will dress. The day of the Lord's sacrifice is coming. And he says on that day, he will punish the princes. He will punish the king's children. And all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the sight of the Lord, what a strange apparel. Well, whatever makes you strange to the Lord, whatever makes you strange to the New Testament believers, whatever makes you strange to the church of the living God, that's strange. But let me show you one particular area. Deuteronomy chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 22 Reading from verse 5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Everybody agrees with that. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. If any preacher came in front of you and then dress is a man, but is dressed like a woman, and he has all these things hanging all over the body, and he says, Let us pray. And you look at the appearance, you say, Ah, uh -uh, a man appearing like a woman. This will not be, not only in our church, in any church, any church. All the people will say, No, this is not right. But then they'll meet the first part to go to the second part. The first part says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. That's the first part. The second part, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so, tell me, tell me out aloud. Tell me if you are not an abomination privately. All that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Has God changed? I'm asking church, has God changed? You know, there are people, they feel inferior because they are not copying the world. They feel inferior because the world is not praising them. And they want to appear in the strange apparel so that they can please the world. I will not please the world to displease the Lord. 
I, say it after me, I will not please the world to displease the Lord. The Lord help you stand everywhere you go in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 3. In First Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 3. Whose adorning let it be not that outward adorning or plating the air. It's talking about putting the air together and then stuffing it with whatever is unnatural. Whatever was not part of that air. And it says the adorning should not be that or the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Would you understand? That the apostle Peter was writing to the Jews that were scattered about, but they have not given their lives to the Lord. And the apostle Peter knows, knew everything in the Old Testament. But he said, the old covenant is abolished. The old covenant is cancelled. And now in the new covenant, the people that follow the Lord and the people who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It says, now with the new covenant, it should not be the putting on of apparel or adorning with all these things. And then it says, but let it be the healing man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible, it says, look at the heart, the motives of the heart, and look at the heart, the imagination of the heart, and the propelling desire coming from the heart. And it says, if you are going to please the Lord, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, not loud, not lousy, and not worldly, but you are meek, and you have a quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. For after this manner, in, all, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves. What's that talking about? They adorned themselves with meekness. They adorned themselves with the quiet spirit, being in subjection to their own husbands. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart, obedience starts from the heart. Ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. The inner man, our spirit, is as real and visible to God as the outward man. Our physical body is, as, is real and visible to the world. What I'm saying is, your body is visible to the world, but your inward man, your spirit, is as visible and real in the sight of the Lord. Salvation in Christ clothes the inner man. The true beauty of the inner man pleases God, and that is the meek and the quiet spirit. The corrupted inner man is defiled by pride. Such a man, such a woman, will shift his or her focus from God and will seek to be flattered by the fallen man in the world. Deep-rooted pride is unsearchably hungry. Hungry to the point that he will not be satisfied. Because he's looking for the commendation of the world, for the praise of the world. 
And that's what motivates the people of the world. They want to attract the flattery, the commendation, the praise of the people of the world. Eventually, they are corrupted by the world. Eventually, they are contaminated by the world. They compromise with the world. They have the coloration of the world. That is, the world colors their idea, colors their perspective, and colors their presentation of themselves. And they have conformity to the world. Eventually, they will, with the world, be condemned. There will be the condemnation with the world. I pray God will keep us separate from the world in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 2. I read here from verse 9. Second Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether ye be obedient in all things. I pray that there will not be an area of the word of God that is revealed to you, that is taught to you, that is speak to you, that you will not be obedient in Jesus' name. You will be obedient. You have been obedient before, and you are still obeying, and you keep on obeying the word of God in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the correlation, the connection between true beauty and purity. The connection between true beauty and purity. I'm sure you know, you understand that the heart is inseparably connected with our actions. The heart is inseparably connected with all our actions. Whatever your heart does not instigate or propagate, your hand, your feet, your eyes, your ears will not accept. Because the origin of every action is the heart. So the inner man is inseparably connected with the outward man. What you are on the inside, that's what comes on the outside. If the heart is proud, the primary thought in dressing will be to impress the world. If the heart is dirty and defiled, the apparel and appearance will be defiling. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. It's your heart that decides every action. It's your heart that decides what kind of apparel you put on. It's the heart that decides your appearance. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Is the heart pure? The dressing will be proper. Is the heart impure? The dressing will be improper. Is the heart converted? The dressing will be changed. Is the heart righteous? The dress will be respectable. Is the heart sanctified? The dressing will be scriptural. Is the heart profane? The dressing will be prodigal. Is the heart hardened? The appearance will be haughty. It's a matter of the heart. In Exodus chapter 33, Exodus chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 5. Exodus 33, verse 5. For the Lord had said unto Moses, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are stiff necked people. Ye are a stiff necked people. What does that mean, stiff necked? That just means stubborn. That means heady. That means self willed. Ye are a stiff necked people. I will come into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, to escape that judgment, now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to 
due unto thee. That's the commandment of the Lord. Judgment was coming. And the Lord said they were stiff-necked. The Lord said they were heavy. The Lord said they were stubborn. He said, now I'm coming and I will consume you in a moment. Now for me to know what I will do with you, whether you will change or not, or not put away your ornaments from you. Come to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35 I will read him from verse 2. Genesis chapter 35. I'm reading from verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that are with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. They were going to Bethel, they were going to the presence of God, and he said, Put away every strange God. What has become a God that to worship, a God that to reverence, a God that appears? This is the number one. You see, many people that's what they regard as number one. The way I look, they have mirror at home, and then they take a mirror in their bag, and every now and then they're looking at the mirror. Beauty has become an idol. All the things they put on has become an idol. And Jacob said, put all this away. Let us arise, verse 3, and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hands, and all the earrings that were in their ears. Jacob did not mention that, but they knew in their hearts that thing had become an idol unto them. And that thing had become something that looked indispensable. Now that he said, put away those idols, they gave the earrings to and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem and they journeyed and the terror of the Lord was upon the cities that were round about them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob it tells us in Zechariah chapter 3 Zechariah chapter 3, reading from verse 3 here. In Zechariah chapter 3, reading from verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, filthy in the sight of God, and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. You're coming from the, before the presence of the Lord, and you want to walk and live and appear as the citizens of the kingdom. The Lord is saying, take away the filthy garments. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. That's purity. Filthy garments taken away. On the outside, outward filthiness taken away, and the inward filthiness also taken away. I have caused the iniquity to pass from thee, and I will close thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them search a fair matter upon his search. So they search a fair matter upon his upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, spirit of your heart, spirit of life, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then that shall also judge my people and shall also keep my courts 
and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. It's telling us the purity of heart, taking it with the filthiness of the flesh and the filthiness of life. As well, must go along with the taking away. Watch, dress, the Lord counts strange and counts filthy. Judge, Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 23. Jude, reading from verse 23. And others save with fear, putting them out of the fire, hating even the garments that are spotted by the flesh, hating the garments that are identified with the flesh, there are people who are walking in the flesh, walking for the flesh, and selling the flesh for pleasure. That's their work. And there's a kind of attire, there's a kind of garment they put on, so that they can attract the men of the world to themselves, and so that their flesh shall become the commodity they are selling. The garments are being spotted by the flesh. Anybody that puts on that kind of uh, that kind of garment, people will look at him, will look at her as if it's also of the flesh. And it says in our evangelism and reaching out, we will not see the styles of the world and the appearance of the world and the dressing of the world and those dresses and garments that are associated with the flesh and then copy them. Let me read that again. It says in verse 23, others sit with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And then it says, now unto him, that is able to keep you from falling. Our God will keep you from falling. You're not falling into any trap. You're not falling into the trap of the world. You know, they say, if you want to catch us, be like us and look like us. That's a trap. You will not fall into that trap. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. Amen. We're coming to Psalm 24 and I read from verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24. Reading from verses 3 and 4. It says in Psalm 24 verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. And remember, if your heart is pure, your action will be proper. If your heart is pure, your appearance will be proper. If your heart is pure, your apparel, your look, will be proper. It says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not defiled the soul, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Proverbs chapter 22, reading from verse 11. Proverbs 22, reading from verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, that's his consideration in every word of his mouth. He that loveth pureness of heart, that's his consideration in every action of his hand. He that loveth pureness of heart, that's his consideration in everything he wears. His heart is pure. And the number one thing of his life is the purity of heart. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his leaves, the king shall be his friend. For the grace is graciousness. 
his appearance, his lifestyle. The king shall be his friend. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 8. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. But now he also put off all this, like you put off, put off a dirty garment, and then you wash, and then you put on a new garment, as it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. You wash in the blood of the Lamb. Before then, you put off the dirty, filthy garment. You wash in the blood of the Lamb, and then you put on the new garment. Look at this, verse 8. But now, you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. What's that saying? That is saying, whatever you wear, I don't wear this, I don't wear that. That's good, that's good. But even if you don't wear this and you don't wear that and don't wear the other thing, if you have not put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, feel the communication out of your mouth. Your inner man is not well dressed. Your inner man is filthy. Your inner man is unclean. Even if the outside is clean and outside, the outward man, even if that outward man is well dressed, if the inward man is not well dressed, you still not get to heaven. Anger, we have to put that off. Wrath, we have to put that off. Malice, we have to put that off. Blasphemy, you have to put that off. Feel the communication out of your mouth. Verse 9, lie not one to another. Seen, ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Look at verse 10, and ye have put on. You put off from your inner man all those corrupting, filthy things. And now you put on, you put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. The knowledge that you are now a child of God. The knowledge that this is what is acceptable to God and this is what is not acceptable to God. You are renewed in that knowledge after the image of him that created him. I pray that will be fulfilled in our lives. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Circumcision no circumcision, barbarian, scythian, bunch, no free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, put this one on. It's not just the outward appearance, but your inner man being well dressed. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, bowers of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. No conflict in the heart. No turmoil in the heart. Only peace in the heart. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Look at verse 17. Whatsoever ye do, whatsoever ye do, whatever it is you are doing, eating or drinking, dressing, or whatever you put on, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father, to God, and the Father by Him. And you do everything according to the word of God. First Timothy, I'm reading from chapter 2. First Timothy, chapter 2. I read from verse 8. In verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Every believer should, should agree with that. Men lifting up holy hands without wrath, without anger, without malice, without indignation, and without doubting. Look at verse 9. In like manner, he spoke to the men. And he says, we lift up holy hands. And he says now, in like manner, with the same kind of holiness, and with the same heart, and with the same motive, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. You want know, to understand, Paul was writing majorly to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were terrible in their worldliness. The Gentiles, they were much more deep into worldliness than the Jews. And when Peter wrote to the Jews, they wrote, he knew they would understand, not putting on of apparel or plating of air or this or that. He spoke to them because they already, they already understood. But now the Gentiles, he said, Gentile believers, he says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Then it was very clear, not with broided air, blown up air, stopped air, with all these things, all this attachment of gold or pearls or costly array but which become it women professing godliness with good works. Instead of spending all the money you have on all those extra things that do not add to the God-given beauty he has given you, spend that money doing good in your neighborhood and doing good unto people around you. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, we're reading from verse 8. In verse 8, the Lord said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the people that go to God and they know the number one thing God is looking for is purity of heart. And their hearts are purified by faith through the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And so he says, blessed are those pure in heart, they shall see God. I pray you'll see God on the final day. And the things of this world will not take that great heavenly final eternal privilege away from you in Jesus' name. First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 3. First John chapter 3. Reading from verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, kingdom citizens. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man, how many people? Tell me, tell me. 
tell yourself every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure purify the inner man and the outward man will be dressed appropriately we're coming to point number three now the commendation of transferable beauty by the prince the commendation by the prince was the prince commending was the king of kings commending was the lord of lords commending was a redeemer commending was he praising our lives is praising transferable beauty transferable beauty how do you transfer beauty and what is transferable beauty have you understood that transferable con uh, convictions are transferable scriptural doctrines i believe the word of god i hold on to the word of god i teach that i transfer that it's a transferable conviction that i have and when you look at the people around you you see parents they transfer their conviction to their children by their consistent action they transfer we who are believers will transfer our conviction to the converts by our practice let's go beyond that even animals transfer habits and skills to their offspring that's why lions do not act like sheep because immediately the lioness immediately little lions are born the lion parent will transfer the courage the skill the might and the focus of the lion onto that little lion habits and skills are transferred and so lions will not act like sheep eagles will not act like doves why because immediately those eaglets are brought to this world the eagles will transfer their skills onto the eaglets come back to the human society sinners transfer worldliness to their children and to their families immediately their girls are born they punch ears in their holes in their ears they're transferring a concept they're transferring an idea this is how your parents this is how they live and this is how we live and we transfer this to you sinners transfer worldliness to their children and families religious people transfer tradition to their followers immediately somebody goes to a church where they don't wear shoes and they wear white garment they transfer that to their converse and to their people and whether you find that church in nigeria or you find it in south africa or you find it in new york america or you find it in london in europe anywhere they transfer their tradition to their followers now you you are born again you believe the lord you believe the word of god what are you transferring to your children what are you transferring to your family what are you transferring to your converts holiness or worldliness what are you transferring christian dressing or worldly dressing what are you transferring conviction or condemnation what are you transferring the commendation of transferable beauty by the prince genesis chapter 18. in genesis chapter 18 I'm reading from verse 19 for i know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the lord to do justice and judgment that the lord may bring upon abraham that which he has spoken of him god says i know abraham he will transfer his conviction and his faith about me 
he will transfer my commandments that I gave him, he will transfer the circumcision, he will transfer the, all those things unto his children. I know him so that I will fulfill that which I have spoken concerning him. The question is, what are you transferring? By your life at home, by your appearance at home, by your talk to your children, by your teaching to your converts, and by your attitude to every doctrine of the Bible. What are you transferring to your converts and to the members of the church? We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I read from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Transfer it to your children. You believer, when a daughter, a girl is born in your family, you don't punch hole in the ears of that child. Why? Because you want her to eventually become a believer. And you want her to follow the Lord. And you want her to follow you, the mother, and to follow the family. Because of that, you are transferring a concept. You are transferring an understanding. And you are not punching holes in their ears. If you do, you are contradicting yourself. Don't wear this because I don't wear it. Follow the same God that I follow. Serve the same God that I serve. But I'll make way for you if you don't want to. I'll prepare you for that and punch holes in your ears. Verse 7, And thou shalt teach diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them the teachings of the word of God for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless before thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. In Joshua chapter 7 Joshua chapter 7 I read from verse 20 Joshua chapter 7 we're coming to verse 20 here is Achan telling us what happened what he saw what he coveted what he took and it became the trap of death for him Joshua chapter 7, reading from verse 20. And he can answer Joshua and said, Indeed, I sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw, we see many things in society, we see many things in our neighborhoods. When I saw, so the spoils of a goodly Babylonish garment, the garments of Babylon, the garments of the world, when I saw. But you know what? He was the only one that saw that. Other people saw that too. But there was a magnet in his heart that attracted him to the Babylonish garment. And he didn't think about this. When will I wear this? How will I wear this? In the midst of which people would I wear this? But he saw the Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then, number one, number two rather, I coveted them. Number one, I saw. Number two, I coveted. Number three, I took them and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. You know the story? It brought death unto him. 
the world will not kill you. The things of the world will not take you away from God. Appearance of the world dressing like the world will not take grace away from your life. In Exodus chapter 23, Exodus chapter 23, verse 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. That multitudes are doing it. That doesn't justify it. If it is wrong, it is wrong. In the days of Noah, only eight people were found righteous. And thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people were found wrong. The majority was wrong. And the majority is always wrong. The multitude is always wrong. Look at the children of Israel. Six hundred thousand came out of the land of Egypt. They were to go to the land of Canaan, the promised land. Only two of them got to the land of Canaan. God doesn't work by a multitude, by the majority. The majority are doing it. Multitudes of people are doing that. Go back to the word of God. And it says in verse 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. You will not do evil in Jesus' name. You'll be righteous. I will be righteous. I will remain righteous. You're not going to pick up at this late hour when the Lord is about to come. You're not going to pick up a goodly Babylonish garment. I was waiting for your amen there. You're not going to pick up all these worldly dresses and worldly appearance in Jesus' name. If you have picked them all up already today, you will throw them away. As you get back home, you check your wardrobe, you check everywhere. That's of the world, that's of the world. That's a Babylonish garment, that's a worldly garment, that's Egyptian garment. And all of them, you dispose of them and throw them away in Jesus' name. I'm coming to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 16, rather. In Romans chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Your neighbors will see your obedience. Your relatives will see your obedience. Members of the church will see your obedience in Jesus' name. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ he was you. First Peter, First Peter, chapter 5, reading from verse 5. First Peter, chapter 5, reading from verse 5. In verse 5, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Likewise, ye younger, that's the word of God, submit yourselves unto the elder. The elder knows more than you know. You're young. The elder has gone beyond you. You're following him. And Peter referred to himself as an elder, an apostle, an elder. And he says, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye, all of you, be subject one to another and be closed with, tell me, and be closed with, and I want to hear, and be closed with humility, for God resisteth the proud. As he resisted Pharaoh, he's still resisting the proud today. As he resisted Nebuchadnezzar, he's still resisting the proud today. As he resisted Herod, he still resists the proud today, for God resisted the proud. 
and giveth grace to the humble. I'll grant you more grace. Revelation chapter 3. I read from verse 3. Revelation chapter 3. I read from verse 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. For those of us who have been in the church for a long time, and from the early years we have heard the word of God on Christian dressing, on Christian appearance, on moderation, on coming out of every form of worldliness. It says, remember therefore how thou was received and heard. And for those of us who are just hearing it now and what we are receiving, remember therefore what you have received and what you have heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Your garments will not be defiled. Garments of salvation will not be defiled. Garments of holiness will not be defiled. And the garments, the outside garment that were put on, so that it will not ask your friend, how camest thou in, not having the wedding garment, that garment will not be defiled in Jesus' name. That your garments shall not defile, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. You'll be worthy in Jesus' name. He that overcometh all the temptations, he that overcometh all the trials, he that overcometh all the eroding worldliness into some people's lives, or he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The Lord confirmed that in your life. Yeah. Revelation chapter 19, I read from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice for the, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Our righteousness, our holiness, our purity, the garment that we need to be wearing for the inner man every time will not be taken away from any of us in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1 verse 14. First Peter chapter 1 verse 14. As obedient children, what kind of children are we? As obedient children, what kind of child are you? As obedient children of fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy, for God is holy. You remain holy. You will not be worldly. You will not be sinful. You will not be unrighteous. In your heart, holiness in your appearance holiness every day and every moment holiness and that holiness will take you to heaven when christ comes in jesus name look away from the world look unto jesus the author and the finisher of your faith let him be the king of your life the lord of your life the prince of your life and this transferable beauty possess that and then transfer to all the converts and transfer to all the people in the church 
by your appearance. The new converts that are coming in, they'll, be, they'll know that this is how a child of God dresses. Even before they see all these verses we're quoting in the word of God, they will know that that's the appearance of a child of God and the Christian godly beauty will be transferred from you, from everybody that comes across you in Jesus' name. And the great reward of the Lord will be upon your life in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I read from verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates unto the city. But for without are the dogs, you will not be a spiritual dog. You will not be a spiritual dog. You will not go back to your vomit. For without a dogs and sorcerers and all mongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie you will not be of that in Jesus name I Jesus I sent my angel to, to testify unto you these things in the churches not only in one church in the churches I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star, the spirit and the bright say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is the thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Yeah. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Give me a good amen. amen. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Anybody saying amen there? He who testifies says these things, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's rise up with an obedient heart, an obedient mind, an obedient will and say, Lord, I've heard your word. I will not take a judge away. I will not take a title away. I will not add my own human opinion. I will not add human tradition. We have heard, we have read, we have seen, we have interpreted in particular from 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9 today. Lord, I have an obedient heart, I will obey. And we have heard from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5. Lord, I will obey. We have heard from Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5. And you have heard all those references of scripture. Be a kingdom citizen and say, Lord, I will obey.